Hello Booktube, um, today's video is going to be slightly different from one I've, any I've made before in that this is a topic suggested by a subscriber of mine, um, not one that I've come up with myself. Um, the person who uh, suggested it was um, Jim Chaplin. Um, he was on a comment on my review of The Liberal Party by RJ Cruikshank and he wondered if I could do a, a, a list of British political history recommendations which is a great idea and so this is what this video is going to be today. Now I should say that most of these will be uh, recommendations about British political history of the 20th century, particularly the post-war era, but there will be some early 20th century, 19th century, even um, even 18th century British political history. So um, I'll just start and go through them. There's quite a few, but I, won't, um, I will hopefully make sure this, this um, video isn't too long. But I'm going to go to uh, some detail about each book. Um, so that you can get a good idea of what about them, whether you want to read them or not. Uh, the first is Salisbury, Victorian Titan from 1999 by Andrew Roberts, which is a um, biography of the third Marquess of Salisbury, who was leader of the Conservative Party from 1880 to 1902 and was Prime Minister in for a short time in 1886, then from 1887 to 1892, and then from 1895 to 1902. Uh, he died in 18. Um, yeah, 18 Sorry, nine, he died in 1903 and he was born in 1830, I believe. Um, and you get, you, uh, Salisbury is usually it, usually depicted in, until I think relatively recently, in, uh, in a lot of the political histories as sort of a code to Disraeli. Right. He was understandably the big Conservative, was the man who helped found the Conservative Party and was a big influence on it in the mid, the sort of second, the sort of third quarter of the 19th century. And Salisbury seems, as they say, a code or an afterthought. Where he wasn't. He, as much as Disraeli in the 19th century, made the modern Conservative Party. And Roberts' uh, biography, which is quite big, is um, because that is comprehensive. You get a really good look at the man, uh, the politics of his time, his attitude towards life, his attitude towards the Conservative Party and politics. Um, you get, you also get the, the, con the same contradictions of the man, where where Salisbury was on the one hand a confirmed aristocrat, an opponent of democracy, an angle of right-wing intellectual, but who also was excellent at um, the democratising politics of his era. He was a brilliant manager of them, and he held together a coalition of traditional conservatives, Whigs and radicals in the Unionist coalition of the 1890s. He was, um, and, and whilst he was opposed to democracy and the expansion of the franchise, he also believed that women would be perfectly fine having the vote. He was a very accomplished man, a fascinating man. Um, one of my political heroes, if you look at, if you, actually the, um, the profile picture of my channel is of Salisbury. It's a photograph of Salisbury from the 1880s, I think, or the 18, uh, no, from the 1890s. And so I, I, one of my heroes, this is one of the books I really sort of cemented against that my political hero, one of my heroes. And he's just a fascinating figure of Victorian Britain and of the history of the Conservative Party and history of conservatism. Because he was, as well as I say, he was an angler, he was described, described in another book on this um, list as an angler, angular, right wing, right wing intellectual, and he really was. He did think he wrote a series of, a series of articles during the 1860s under the assumed name uh, anonymously for the Quarterly Review and the Saturday Review, which were conservative, um, conservative uh, journals. And they're, if you ever get a chance to read those, do because you get a very good insight into his insight into his view of politics, as well as the as well as the events of the day, which he's describing. Um, you also get a look at Salisbury's personal life, where he was sort of uh, where he was a very much um, not the uh, sort of the stereotype of a Victorian father. He was deeply interested in his children's life. He was deeply had a very good relationship with them. He loved his wife deeply. In fact, um, he was he though he became a marquis uh, in the late eighteen in I think eighteen sixty seven or eighteen six eighteen late eighteen sixties. He was actually the second son, and it was his elder brother who was blind who was going to inherit the title. But and so he had to earn his own living, and he used to, he met his wife who fell in love with her. But his father opposed the match because he didn't think she was suitable, and so. He, Salisbury got cut off by his father, but that didn't disturb him. He still married her and he was able to support his wife. And so it's fascinating to look at his family life, where he is a very, seems a very uh, loving husband and father who's very much the, the, 
very much the opposite of the sort of stereotype of the Victorian card that you generally get in of that period. Um, overall, it's a really good book. I mean, Andrew Roberts, uh, if you've never read, even if you haven't read this book, it's it's very much his sort of solid writing that you get in his other histories. Um, and so I really would recommend that as a biography of Soldier, but also a good introduction to the Victorian politics from the 1860s up until, well, the early, until right at the beginning of the Edwardian era in 1902. The next one is a biography is the, is Edmund Burke from 1967 by Russell Kirk, which is a biography of the Irish politician and founder of British conservatism, uh, Edmund Burke, uh, who is probably most famous for his book, uh, The History of the Reflections on the Revolution in France, which is a sort of very prophetic uh, criticism of the French Revolution, where he declares, written in 1790, that the French Revolution is going to go to descend into bloodshed, as it did with the terror, and then there's going to be a military dictatorship, which of course did happen the year after, um, after Burke's death, when Napoleon took power. And, to, and, and Kirk gives you a, gives you a, a, a single volume uh, biography of Burke's life, his time before, his time in Ireland, how much Ireland influenced him his time in Parliament, his, his, his actions as a historian, because he wrote a number of, he wrote about, he wrote, um, it was called the National Register, where he wrote about history, and he also wrote um, a book on a, a philosophical, he wrote a, a philosophical book on the difference between beautiful and, between, uh, beauty and between beauty and the sublime, I think that's what it was. Where there's a topic, and that's interesting if you read it. Um, and so you then you get his later political career. It's a very um, interesting book. It's written in the 60s, so it's long before. It's at the time when Burke was not as well, was sort of before the sort of revival that Burke had, of interest that Burke had that began to the 80s and 90s. But it's an interesting book to read. It's a bit, I find, I find Kirk a bit hard going in, his, in that book. A lot less so in his other book, which is called uh, the con about called the, called the Conservative Mind, which isn't which I wouldn't which is not which is a it's a recommendation to, to read, but is not a British political recommendation. That, but that and his other books along. Uh, Kirk's fiction is very good. He short he read a couple, read a couple of short stories, which I enjoyed. So, but so Kirk's a good guy. But this book is not as um, readable as I found the other stuff he's read. But it's a good uh, biography of Burke. The next book is T Citizen Clem from 2016 by uh, John Bew. This is a biography of Clem Tatley, who was leader of the Labour Party from 1935 to 1955, and he was British Prime Minister from 1945 to 1951. He, he, he led the uh, Labour government uh, of that period of 1945-51, and he was He's, that government carried out huge uh, check was a sort of team changing sea change in British politics and it enacted it, it influenced pretty much every government from uh, following it up until the election of Margaret Thatcher in 1979 and you get a good over, again a good overview of that his career both in politics and his previous as well as his wartime experience an interesting thing about that was he served in Gallipoli and which was a, a, a great disaster during the First World War which Winston Churchill was really one of the architects of but actually throughout his life, defended the Gallipoli campaign and defended Churchill's role in this, which is interesting given that obviously Attlee and Churchill were political opponents from which was 1940 until, Attlee, until Churchill's resignation in 1954. So it's interesting. <coughs> that was an interesting, interesting thing to read about, and as well as his background and also his post-war, um, his post-premiership uh, uh, career, as well as his sort of anti um, what was an EEC anti what becomes now EU stance where he opposed Britain joining the EEC EU as it becomes. Uh, so overall good conference of biography. You get a good insight into the at the government, the uh, the sort of the personalities that Attic was dealing with, particularly so you've got Ernest Bevin, Hugh Dalton, Herbert Morrison, um, you've got the staff of Crips, not you can't even because it's staff of Crips. You can't forget the staff of Crips, sorry. Interesting figure in in and of itself, um, and you get also so it's really good. It's a good basis in that government, in that sort of government, and sort of how and gives you an idea, gives you a good idea of how it sort of influenced politics afterwards, as well as sort of 
more broadly sort of interesting book, and Plymouth Dutton is like uh, a fascinating man in many ways. Uh, the next uh, three books are all by Rob Jenkins, who was a Labour politician, a Labour then SDP, then the Democrat politician um, in Britain. Uh, he, I think he was elected in 1944 as a Labour MP. He left, I think, the House of Commons for the first time in the mid-70s to become president of the European Commission, and then he returned in the 80s as an SDP MP for Glasgow Hillhead or Headhill. Or it, it was a Glasgow seat anyway, he won it in 1982. And then he ended up as a peer of the realm when he, as he, as he got left the Commons, I can't remember, I think it must have been sometime in 87. Might have been 87, I think. And then he ended up in the House of Lords, where he sat as a Liberal Democrat for when the SDP and the Liberals united. And he wrote, he was, he was, he was, and he wrote numerous books about British politics and British history. But the three I've got here are three biographies of British Prime Ministers. The first one is his biography of William Gladstone from 1995, called Gladstone. A very good comprehensive overview of Gladstone's career, both from his startings, of Gladstone's life and career, both his start as a Tory MP in the 1830s up until he sort of moves from back as the sort of into his stride as uh, the great prime, the liberal prime minister of the Victorian era, known as the uh, People's William. Um, and it's and Jenkins is a great writer, so it's really enjoyable to read, and it's it's a great thing to read. Um, I've read a couple of other other uh, Gladstone biographies, but this is my favourite of them. The next one is his 2001 biography of Churchill, which is titled Churchill. Again, it's a one. This is a good one volume um, history of uh, biography of Winston Churchill from life to death. You get it covers Churchill's uh, career before uh, the Second World War, which is not as well known to people, understandably, because of his act, as, as his time in as Prime Minister during the Second World War. Uh, it also covers obviously the Lord Mish years and then the post-war years, both as leader of the opposition and as Prime Minister, where you get a look at Churchill in his second government, where he really wasn't effective as a Prime Minister. Um, Particularly in kind, particularly compared to his time as wartime leader, and Jenkins does that well. He also shows the sort of per, the pro, uh, the private side of Churchill, his depression and his relationship with his children, his wife. It's really good. Um, then the final one of Jenkins's book is from 1984. It's Baldwin, and it's a book for Stanley Baldwin, a prime minister who I don't have a great deal of time for, who I don't particularly like. You get, you get a good overview of his life and career, his family, his political uh, his political career, particularly time as the opposite leader, where he led the Conservative Party from 1923 to 1937. When usually he was a Prime Minister who chose to stand down, a Tory leader who chose to resign. He didn't have to. He could have gone on, I think, um, as Prime Minister for a few more years and neither the Tory backbenchers nor the national government in general would have opposed it, but he chose his time to resign and went into retirement uh, of his own uh, of his own choosing and at the time it was the right time for him. Uh, he was very much viewed positively, not so much subsequently given um, <coughs> given his sort of promotion of appeasement. But it's a good account of a man who I'm not a particular fan of. Uh, the next uh, next book is uh, Hugh Gates School from 1982 by Philip N. Williams. This is um, now Hugh Gates School is a figure who's not very well known, I don't think at all, outside of people really interested in British public history. He was leader of the Labour Party from 1955-56 until his death in 1963, and he really was a sort of Labour reformer. He wanted to reform the Labour Party. He tried to do what Tony Blair tried to do in the 1990s. Uh, dealing with court to uh, remove or change clause four, which was the which is the uh, the clause in the Labour Party's constitution, which called for nationalisation, and he wanted to change that. And Gay School, for, for me personally, I've always found Gay School interesting because I think he was one of the two post-war politicians who, if they had become prime minister, would have changed the country and probably in their different ways uh, better. And you get the sense that you get the real sense of gay school and man, as well as his political, uh, as well as his political um, outlook and how that would have influenced Britain. How he, in fact, did because Gates, though Gates School died, a number of Gates Schoolites, people who were Gates Schoolism, uh, were advocates of Gates Schoolism, were sort of Gates School political belief, did end up in government. And uh, Roy Jenkins being one of them. Another one is uh, 
this Jim Callaghan, who of course had Middle Fields Prime Minister in the late seventies, and they were there then to the get up gate schools political what Glasgow would have done in the late Liberal government of the sixties and seventies, but it was it was watered down. Uh, whereas gate school, it would have been a really a, a real uh, it would have been as influential in terms of Labour governments as the as far as, as, far as I'm concerned as the um, Attlee government was in the forties if Gates School had been Prime Minister and it would have been a positive thing I think. Um, <coughs> and unfortunately, he um, died in early nineteen sixty three of um, lupus, uh, which was a sad loss. And I say I do think he was one of the one of the two politicians who would have post war who would have been great prime ministers. I don't know, the next biography of the man who I think was is the other one. If the one of us to put the other one to of those two people would have been uh, a great post war prime minister. And that is like the Roman, the life and time of Enoch Powell, uh, nineteen ninety eight by Simon Heffer. Powell is a was a Conservative politician. He was controversial because he gave a speech in nineteen sixty eight on immigration, which I don't agree with, though it is an important speech in the sense that it was the first time a British politician had given a speech on that issue, which was greatly concerning the general public at the time, and it was an issue that needed to be needed to be spoken of. Though Powell, I don't think, did it the right way. It's a really good biography. Um, you get a good account of Powell's whole life because this, and it was an authorized biography. I think it was it was an authorized biography which Powell allowed to be done as long as it was published after his death and it was I don't think it was published a few months after his death because he died in ninety eight early ninety eight. <coughs> and so you get a look at Powell's life from birth to death. And you read it, it, it covers his life me, it covers a lot of areas of his life that most people don't know because most people when they think of Enoch Powell they only think of that immigration speech. Uh, the, the, the the immigration speech itself is Somewhat is inaccurately called the rivers of blood speech, which isn't in the speech. What Powell does is he quotes the Aeneid and he says, Like the Roman, I see the river tide foaming with much blood. And that's where obviously the title of the biography comes from that. Um, but Powell was a lot more than that. He was a classicist. He was the youngest, uh, 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 youngest professor in the British Empire and Commonwealth um, in, I think, he was appointed in 1907. As a, a to I think one, to an Australian university, he was a classical scholar, an extremely good one. In fact, he's, uh, he wrote a lexicon of Thucydides, or he may have been Herodotus, which is still today used by classicists in British universities. And he was a poet. He had he stood on he spoke a number of different issues about Europe and in many ways sort of Brexit. And many of the arguments used by uh, people. Um, who argued for Brexit were using Powell's arguments for the national sovereignty and the sovereignty of Parliament, uh, along, uh, in addition to sort of Tony Benn, his argument for it was a poet of, uh, he was also an opponent of the uh, European Union on the Labour side. Um, you also get his interest in Northern Ireland, uh, where he, in fact, he sat as a um, Ulster Unionist MP from 1974 to 1987 or 86 into the late 80s as an Ulster Unionist MP. So you get that description, you get that description of his career where he was a deep supporter of, he was unusual in the fact that he supported not the return of the storm of Parliament in Northern Ireland but the inter integration of Northern Ireland into the UK, back into the UK as it had been before 1922. And so you get these discussion of these parts of his life which are not generally spoken of because of the immigration speech that sort of that sort of seems to dominate I don't think anybody ever says about him for the most part. And so it's a really interesting discussion of that of his career as a whole. Um, I've read a number of biographies of Powell and this is the best because all the others the authors are unable to get past their political dislike of Powell. And they seem to be unable to say anything other than that immigration speech. Whereas this one, where Simon Heffer is sympathetic to Powell, which I've said, but he, do, he doesn't let that sort of gain the way of giving you a clearer view of, of his career and as a man. And so you get to see the man in the, in, as a whole, not just that purely that immigration, um, <coughs> that, that, that one issue of immigration that seems to dominate the way people talk about Powell. Um, it's also Tom Heffer's a great writer, it's written, it's really nicely written. So, I, if you ever see that, 
I'm glad you mentioned Gerrit, um, and it's also important because Powell is more so than Margaret Thatcher the most one of the biggest influences on British politi- British conservatism post-war. He does talk about, he, he is the man who influences British conservative attitudes towards uh, immigration, towards Europe, towards devolution, uh, towards uh, economic seizures, uh, and I forget of free market economics um, in a uh, Sort of, as a, in a way, sort of a, a, a John the Baptist figure to Margaret Thatcher and the Thatcherites, but he was very different. He also has actually he also has attitude towards uh, different. Part. He also he, <coughs> he also he had attitudes which were different from Thatcherism in the sense that he was, for example, an opponent of Brit- of Britain's continuing involvement with the Commonwealth. He thought that as soon as Britain the Empire was over, Britain should um, sort of cast aside. Um, uh, Links with them. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. It, Powell thought that, some, uh, that um, Britain should sort of cast aside its links with the Commonwealth and um, Sweden returned to being a sole making state. And I say he would have been interesting because would have been uh, would have been a, a great prime minister post war because that that's why he was he 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 like Gates could recognise that the empire was over in Britain. Was going back to being a nation state, and it, 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 there needed to be a debate over what Britain's role in the world, if Britain had a role in the world, and what that would be. And they were both, Gates School and Powell, prepared to have that debate and were prepared to put the country on a path that would, along on that path of recognising that and uh, develop the country as a, as a post imperial state, a post imperial nation state, which frankly Britain since. Which after Suez, the country has not been, and our membership of the European Union is in many ways a sort of empire substitute. Um, however, I'm going to slightly off the topic, but so that's a good follow through of Powell. The next one is uh, Curzon, Imperial States from 1994 by um, David Gilmore, which is a biography of the um, the foreign, the uh, viceroy of India, foreign secretary, and man who should have been prime minister in 1922, says of Stanley Baldwin. Uh, Lord Curzon, who was a fascinating figure of the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, and the interesting sort of deep details and somewhat arrogant, but brilliant, brilliant statesman of his era. And as I say, he should have been Prime Minister in 19, um, 1923, sorry, not Stanley Baldwin, but it's really, really well written, really entertaining. Uh, interestingly, David Gilmore wrote a, um, a biography of Richard Kipling called uh, "Recessional: uh, The Imperial Life of Richard Kipling." That's, that's the title. Um, which, if you if you're interested in Kipling, I greatly greatly advise you to get. It's a really good book as well. <coughs> um, but again, that is uh, that's the most uh, recent biography of Curzon, I believe. And um, I think the, the, an earlier one was written in the late twenties, written in the twenties or thirties, and it's and Reading Gilmore's account of it, it's in his in his introduction. Uh, Gilmore doesn't seem to have a high, a very high opinion of it, um, and so I I would stick with Gilmore's uh, biography of Curzon. Uh, the next one is a uh, is Joseph Chamberlain from 1977, Bean Up Pound. It's a biography. Um, it's of Joseph Chamberlain, who was a Victorian politician and uh, Victorian Lord politician, father of Austin, Sir Austin Chamberlain, who would go on to become leader of the Conservative Party and Foreign Secretary and win the Nobel Prize for the Lacan Pact in 1926. And more famously, his other son was Neville Chamberlain, who was obviously the British Prime Minister from 1937 to 1940, uh, the Association of Appeasement and the outbreak of the Second World War, the man who Winston Churchill succeeded. And you get to, Powell gives you a through his biography, a look at Victorian politics and Edwardian politics, particularly uh, the issue of Irish Home Rule, which Powell rightly sees as sort of the central issue to Chamberlain's, um, Chamberlain's career. And so <coughs> you, get, you get a very good description of the man and his sort of and description of the man in the, in the 1880s, 1890s, of his sort of fights with Gladstone over Irish Home Rule, his enjoying him, him leaving the um, 
the they can Liberal Party with uh, Lord Harnty to, to join the Liberal you know, sue them like the Conservatives with Lord Salisbury and you sort of see the, the sort of how that happened and you see the sort of formation of the government in the, that co that unionist coalition between the, the Conservatives and the Liberal Unionists and eventually you get to see uh, Chamberlain in government, particularly his conflict with Bourbon and uh, his campaign on tariff reform, the idea of forming the British Empire into a uh, sort of free trade bloc where there will be protective, uh, protectionist tariffs stopping things against imports, but imports within uh, Britain become what will become the dominions and the colonies, but with all uh, trade barriers between Britain and the, the soon to be dominions and the colonies being removed, allowing free trade there. And how that split the Conservative Party um, in the Edwardian era, led, led by um, Salisbury's nephew um, Balfour, and that's really good. Um, the next biography is, um, and it's book sorry, which is a biography, is um, Harold Macmillan from 2009 by Charles Williams. Again, it's a good uh, overview, single uh, volume account of Macmillan's career and life. Um, interestingly, it's, what, it's a contrast to the what I mentioned about the biographies of. Um, you know, previous biographies we got Powell and the, and the fact that Macmillan was a conservative, but Williams is not. Williams is, in fact, I'm not sure if he's still alive. He may well be, uh, but he was or is a Labour politician. He, but he writes very well about Macmillan and doesn't let his personal political beliefs get in the way of that. And it's very comprehensive and enjoyable to read. Uh, the second, the next book is Supermac. Life of Harold Macmillan from 2011 by R.D. Thorpe, another biography of um, Macmillan. Uh, this is, uh, though Williams' biography is really is nice to read, Thorpe, is, I think, is a better writer and it's as comprehensive and really enjoyable to read. More so, I would say, just just more than uh, Williams' biography. Um, the next one is Dangerous Hero. 2019 by Tom Bell, which is a biography of Jeremy Corbyn. It's um, a critical biography of Corbyn, but I think it gives a, 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 a critical, clear that Bauer doesn't like Corbyn's politics, but it's accurate. And so it's worth a read to get a look at him. Um, there have been a couple of other biographies of Corbyn, which I found one which was written by a, a Daily Telegraph journalist, which was it was what it was reasonably good it didn't really it didn't really uh, it didn't really uh, grip me and then there was another one written by somebody who was clearly a Corbynite as a, 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 a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn and that just came over as hagiography and I didn't enjoy that whereas uh, Dangerous Hero very much did I very much enjoyed that um, the next one is Harold, Harold Wilson from 1992 by Ben Pimlot. Uh, this is a biography of Harold Wilson, who was a leader of, oh, I should say about Macmillan, he was the leader of the Conservative Party from 1957 to 1963, and then he was Prime Minister in the period as well. Uh, Harold Wilson was Prime Minister from 1964 to 1970, and then from 1974 to 1976, he led the government's, he succeeded in Gateskill, and he led governments between in that period of time. Um, he, he was leader of the Labour Party from 63 to 76, and he sort of brought in very memorable liberal reform, particularly with very, particularly with um, Roy Jenkins as his Home Secretary, with the uh, legalisation of abortion, the legalisation of homosexuality, uh, the liberalisation of divorce laws. He brought he he, uh, he brought in uh, open university as well, you know, uh, opening. Uh, uh, university education to people who couldn't necessarily attend the university for various reasons for themselves it allows you to do um, which is still going today um, and you get to see his relationship with the Americans particularly dealing with Vietnam where he was able to keep uh, British troops out and going into Vietnam one of the interesting things is if Gates could have lived Gates could have been very pro-American probably would have sent British troops to Vietnam which would have been a fascinating uh, situation for Britain in the 60s if that had happened but Wilson was very much opposed to that and was able to keep he was able to sort of balance staying on the good side of the um, the Americans led by obviously at that point uh, Lyndon B. Johnson was keeping Britain out of Vietnam and so it's a good read but uh, Pivot's an interesting author he wrote a biography of the, of the late Queen which is also worth a read as well 
The next one is The Course of My Life from 1998 by Ed Latif. This is, I think, the only autobiography on this list. But I put it on there because whilst I'm listening to I have, I am somewhat ambiguous about Heath. Uh, it's interesting that he gives a course, of, you get to discuss of Heath discusses his life in, uh, as, as a whole um, and his time at university, his time particularly in the 30s when he travelled across Europe and he saw, uh, he went to, I think he, he certainly went to Germany, I think he went, he was in Spain where he, where he got shot at during the Spanish Civil War, he was just visiting there, he wasn't fighting and, he, and in fact he was in, I mentioned Germany, he was actually in Germany at the outbreak of war and he uh, sort of saw that take place, and that's very much influenced him. And then he also discusses his wartime career, which is interesting. He served um, in the Royal Artillery. I think he won the military. He might have won the military medal, the military cross. He was a decorated man, certainly a personally brave man. Uh, wherever I might disagree with him over his politics, um, you also go look at his time as a minister under the, under um, Churchill, the evening at Millen, and then obviously his time as the leader of the Conservative Party, and subsequently his time he was doing what was known as Great Sulk after he got thrown out in the 75 Martin Thatcher became Prime became leader and then at 79 Prime Minister. So it's an interesting look at his life of a man who there's a very good um, documentary by Michael Cockrell called A Singular Man and that's very much what he was. He was a very singular man. And I uh, give both his biography of his autobiography a read as well as that Michael Cockrell documentary. Uh, the next um, one Next one is a is Margaret Thatcher North Rose Biography by Giles Moore. This came out in three um sorry <coughs> it came out in three volumes over the course of a couple of years. So volume one, which covers her life uh, obviously from birth up until pretty much Falklands War, uh, which was called uh, Not Returning, was published in two thousand thirteen. Then there's volume two, Everything She Wants, two thousand fifteen, which covers her time in government, and volume three. Herself alone, 2019, obviously covers her time after 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 a premature nuclear death. And it's very comprehensive. You know, gives you a good over, gives you a really in depth look at her life. Um, however, if you're not, however, if you'd like something more, um, more, and also being authorised, you ha like with the Powell uh, biography, you get a lot of uh, Powell. Uh, um, Thatcher was interviewed a great deal throughout her sort of the 90s uh, through sort of her post premiership life by Moore. Um, so you've got a huge amount of wealth and not wealth of details from her as well as her family. Um, now, however, if you want a sort of a, a more one volume comprehensive biography, there is one which is published the same published in 2013 by Robin Harris called, which is I think called Margaret Thatcher. Which is worth a read as well. Uh, Robin Harris is actually on this uh, on this um, list for another book, but that but his biography, his single biography, single volume biography, Mark Thatcher is also worth a read. If you uh, if you if you feel that the three volumes that uh, Moore uh, did is a bit too much. Uh, the next uh, four, the next three books are all diaries by the conservative, the late conservative, the Alan Clark. Now, Alan Clark was a sort of controversial, womanising. Uh, MP who ended up as a junior defence minister um, is probably most famous for his diaries, which sort of cover British politics from uh, the, th the, th the three of them. There's the most famous one, which is In Power, uh, 1983-1992, which is very entertaining, covering his time as a minister. Uh, he was Minister of Employment and then he ended up at, at uh, Defence. Um, and it's be as uh, he was also Minister of Trade as well. Never got into the cabinet, but you get to see sort of the worm's eye view of the Thatcher government um, and his interactions with Thatcher, where he clearly was sort of uh, half in love with it, with love in love with her, and um, he does have controversial opinions um, about it. He's, most of which is sort of just for uh, just for um, uh, for the way to provoke people. He clearly intended to write. He was clearly writing the diary with the intention of um, of publishing them. So uh, there's sort of there's elements of, sort of of him having having fun at people's expense. Uh, there's also two uh, two other um bi uh, bi uh, diaries he did um, into politics, which covers from 1972 to 1982. So his time trying to get into Parliament, eventually then getting elected. I think in 79, 1974 or 79. The Conservative Party was actually quite resistant 
to gain into politics because he, he had a career before entering politics as a, as a historian. And uh, what he came, he famously um, wrote a, uh, when he was highly critical of Douglas Haig during the First World War. He, he and if one, I can't remember the book he wrote, the name of the book. He wrote a book about the First World War, which was eventually adapted by Margaret Littlewood as uh, Oh, What a Lovely War, you know, as a as a, a musical, and then eventually a film, a very famous film, you know, 1969. And so he was seen as slightly disreputable. Uh, and so, he, so obviously, in, a, in into politics, you see his attempts again to get selected as a Tory candidate, and then the attempts to stop him, but then eventually getting in, getting uh, selected and then elected. Uh, the, th- the the third volume is the Last Diaries, which covers his life from 1993 to 1999, which was published in 2002. I should say that Into Politics was published in. 2000. Um, the last diaries covers his return to his attempts to get back into Parliament, which he didn't successfully do, but also his the end of his life where he got brain cancer and he write this really much really affectingly about what that does to him. Um, so I I would of the three diaries I'd recommend for sort of for real British political history into power, but also recommend um, the last diaries. Partly because you get to see into the uh, Conservative Party post nineteen ninety seven, the, the immediate aftermath of that, as well as uh, you get a really, as I say, really affecting um, descriptions of him having to deal with what turns out to be terminal brain cancer. Uh, the next biographies are, sorry, the next book is actually a couple of, is a recommendation of a, quite a number of books. I'm not going to name them all just because there's so many. But it's sort of the opposite side of the political spectrum from Alan Clark, which is Tony Benn, who is, who was sort of a, a, a sort of a politician who almost became leader of the Labour Party, almost became deputy leader of the Labour Party. He was very much a man of the left of the party. He was deeply influential on uh, Jeremy Corbyn, and he wrote. He was in the Wilson government and the Callaghan government in the 1670s and he wrote a huge number of di- bi- uh, diaries covering his life from 1940 to 2009 and they're well worth a read because you get a look at his life he was uh, a devout christian he was an ardent socialist um you get to see he, he came from a very famous political family the, the ben family who started out as liberals and then joined the labor party and so you get to see his family you get to see him it's sort of, uh, Combating, uh, seeing him, his fight in the early sixties to disclaim his peerage, because he was initially his father had become a Viscount Stansgate in I think nineteen forty, and then he his father died and he inherited it, but he did, but Ben didn't want to go to the Lords, and so he had this long fight to disclaim his title to return to the, to the Commons, and so you get to see this in the diary as well as his political battles in the seventies, with the Call- with Callaghan over the sort of the the big trade union fights then and winter of discontent and also his campaigns in the 80s to effectively, to effectively become leader of the party which he doesn't succeed in and it's interesting partly because it's a fascinating time capsule of the era in which he's writing and you get to see you get to see the inside the insides of the accounts of the Wilson Callaghan government as well as what also as well as the sort of sort of civil war that went on in the eight in into the late party in the 80s and also you get to see the influences on Jeremy Corbyn because Corbyn became sort of was was Ben's one of Ben's proteges and also you get to see a number of people a number of names uh, crop up who eventually become involved in Corbyn's uh, lead, Corbyn's leadership one of the most notable one what most no, most notable one is um, John Landsman who who um, was heavily involved in Ben's campaigns in the eighties and who eventually became the uh, founder uh, well not really the founder but certainly a senior figure in the Momentum movement. Which helps sort of get Corbyn into uh, into uh, get Corbyn into um, into being like during the Labour Party leadership election in 2015. So that's a movement that really does energise the vote, the left wing voters into supporting Corbyn. It really does become sort of the <coughs> the um, the the sort of the, the sort of um, the, ba- the the backbone of the Corbyn project. Uh, which is sort of outside the Labour Party, so that's interesting to look at. Um, the next one is a sort of classic of British political history. 
is the English Constitution from 1867 by Walter Badgett. Um, the, the version I had, or should I had because I can't find it, was from the 60s or the 70s, and it had a it had an introduction by a lay by a Richard Crossman, who was a, a Wilson, who uh, how, there was a cabinet which had Wilson government. He gives a really good, really good, good uh, description of how, the, how though the British Constitution has changed in the time since Badgett wrote the um, wrote the English Constitution, how, why Badgett is still um, still relevant. And so the, the English Constitution gives a, gives out an overview of the British Constitution. It describes how it came about, elements of how it came about, how it's uh, how it actually works and practical terms um, and it's a good it, if, if you want to understand how the British how, what the British Constitution is and how it works you should read Badgett and in fact as far as I'm concerned more politicians and journalists should be read have clearly haven't been reading Badgett and should be given the way that people have been going on about uh, in Britain recently we've had a controversial controversy or should I say non-controversy about how the government has uh, decided to pass a law that um, repeals international law, which goes against international law, and people have been saying this is illegal, this can't be done. But yes, it can. If if, the, if these journalists and politicians and commentators actually read the English Constitution by Walter Badgett, they'd know that that's entirely constitutional. And so more people should read it. And if you're somebody who's interested in British politics and British political history, you can't go wrong with them giving you a good basic understanding of the political system in Britain by reading um, the English Constitution. Uh, and in connecting to that, there's the new British Constitution from 2009 by Bernard Bogdanall. Bernard Bogdanall is the foremost living British constitutional historian, and he he wrote he, his book is sort of a sequel, in some ways, to Badgett's The English Constitution, where it describes how the British Constitution has changed a great deal, not just since Badgett's time, but sort of massive change to the new Labour, the new Labour governments of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown uh, enacted on the British Constitution, most of which I think are, uh, which were not so much reforms as vandalism, but that's a, 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 a topic for another video. Um, but Bognall gives you a good overview of the changes and the, the way that the British Constitution existed in 2009. And I think there's been updated editions as well to include changes. So we we had for a period of time this come to the fixed term Parliament Act, which meant that Parliament had to vote itself out to uh, to vote itself to dissolve, as opposed to the Prime Minister going to the monarch and asking for a dissolution of Parliament for a general election. Uh, that itself has been removed a few years ago as well. But so uh, if I would if you're going to get that one, get a more recent edition so you can get it, so it would include the more all the uh, changes that have happened. Including Brexit and obviously the repeal of <coughs> of the uh, Fixed Parliament Act. I should say that um, where Badgett is really a sort of entertaining read, Vernon Bogdanall is writing very much more a, um, a a a textbook. So it's so it's more. It's not something that you want to read in one go, but which is sort of a reference book if you want to know if things have changed or. What the position of things are, uh, so you want to know whether who can become prime minister, whether a peer or a or a, um, an MP can become, why a peer can't become prime minister, as opposed to an MP can, or or what Parliament can actually do in terms of its legislation. Uh, the new British Constitution is a good thing to always have it hand so you can read it. And the next book is The Road to 1945 by Paul Addison from 1975. Uh, this gives this is a sort of an account of um, how the post-war consensus, which the Attlee government sort of brought in, uh, came about. It's sort of prehistory in the national government of the 1930s, and then the wartime government of Winston Churchill. And it gives a good side account. It really, really does give a grounding in that. In, in, in <coughs> and it's a, it's worth a read because it describes how the, it gives an explanation to why Churchill lost in 1945 and it was this, it, what, that, it, that whilst appeasement, whilst the fact that appeasement was certainly part of the blame that the Conservatives were blamed for, 
but there's also a sense that the national government, which the Conservatives had been leading in the 30s, had done its job, and it was time for something else. So this one has to be the Labour Party. As well as the fact that the wartime government gave the Labour Part gave the Labour politicians at Lee, Morrison, Bevan and so on. Uh, the state, the stature of being politicians who were in power, who had shown they could act and shown they were responsible, and could be and could run government departments and beat government, and so, so he, Addison chose that along with the sort of the sort of the, the, sort of, the, the fact that the national government may have been too successful in the fact that it was able to deal with domestic matters um, to the degree that they would regard as no longer needed. So it sort of got Labour into power in nineteen forty five. And then the next couple of books, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah, 5 books, are all by the same author, Dominic Sandbrook, and they all cover sort of, they're in some ways sort of natural continuation of uh, Addison's book because they cover post war British politics from the mid 50s up until the early 1980s. And so they are, never had it so good, 2005, which covers the Macmillan government. Uh, White Heat, 90, uh, 2006, which covers uh, the, will, the the end of the Aaron Douglas Hugh, who succeeded the Miller, and then the Wilson government from 64 to 60, 1970. And then State of Emergency, 2010, which covers the Heath government of 1970 to 1974. And then Summer in the Sun, um, sorry, uh, sorry, Season in the Sun, uh, 2011, which covers the, um, the Wilson... Uh, Callahan Gun to 76 79, and then Who Dares Wins 2009, 2019, which covers the covers the Thatcher government from the election in 1979 to the Falklands War. And these give you, these not only cover, these cover politics, they also cover, they're very much social history and cultural history as well, that Sam Brooke writes. So you get a discussion of the changes in British music, society, culture, film. You get, uh, in, in um, Never Had It So Good, you have a description of sort of the uh, spy scandals of the Cambridge spies and the perfume affair. Um, in White Heat, you obviously get this, all the t- big changes of the swing in the sixties. In, in the state of emergency, you get description of Northern Ireland, of um, feminism, of the growth of, uh, of pornography, and <coughs> TV, uh, books, um, and in I think you also get. I'm not sure if it's in. Um, in state of emergency or scenes in the sun, you get the discussion of um, nationalism, so Welsh nationalism and Scottish nationalism. And I think it might, I think that might, might that particularly, I think it will be in, it's in seasons in the sun, I think they, because you get, because that's where you get, that covers the period where you have the 1978 uh, Scottish uh, devolution referendum. And, and seasons in the sun discusses uh, obviously those elements. And, but uh, I think seasons in the sun is a lot more. Political because you've got really that of the, you've got a winter of discontent, a huge amount of uh, industrial unrest. You've got Northern Ireland, and uh, Northern Ireland readers uh, in some ways dominate state of emergency and season in the sun, understandably so, because that was really the sort of, the sort of dark depths of the troubles in the 70s. And then the final volume, which covers obviously the Thatcher, the, the, the early years of the Thatcher government, I haven't yet read. But I'm going to put it on here because it's done at Sandbrook and I've never read a book of his I didn't like. And being in this sort of series, I'm absolutely, I can say, I, I'm going to, I will say that it is almost certainly as good as what came before, if not better. Because it, because having read his books, his books just get better and better and better in this, in this sort of history post with Britain. So I'm actually going to look forward to reading that myself. Um, the next one, the next book is... An English Affair from 2013 by Richard Davenport Hines. This is a an account of the perfume affair and what I regard as the best account because it puts the perfume affair in its political, cultural and social context of the early 60s and the sort of changes that were happening to Britain at the time and how the perfume affair so the perfume affair was sort of was broke out at the sort of perfect Back at the time, to create a perfect storm, politically, socially, and culturally. Uh, I have a particular interest in the perfume affair because that was where I did my university dissertation on. And this book was I read this book just before I went to university, and this was the thing that sort of decided me that when I got to my third year, 
I was going to write my dissertation on the perfume of her because this book really sort of hammered home to me the uh, the point that I'd sort of be, be, I'd been becoming dimly aware of that the perfume of her in and of itself was not a particularly scandalous scandal. That, that for the, to give you a sort of shorthand, John Perfumo was the um, uh, the Secretary of State for War. He had an affair with a young woman called Kristen Keeley, who was a showgirl, who was a, 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 a dancing girl um, stripper uh, who 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 was allegedly. I say allegedly because Dan Portheim makes this point, and I agree with him that he, this is almost certainly not true. Was having an affair with the with a with a low level KGB uh, officer called Evgeny Ivanov, who was the assistant naval attaché in the Soviet embassy, and he sort of caused a, a, a and then, and then um, this guy to the press, Perfumo denied it, and then it came out that he lied, and that and that. That the that the scandal itself became has become sort of the standard scandal for British politics, not because of what actually what the scandal actually contained, but because of when it took place. And that if it had taken place a few years earlier or even a few years later, it would be forgotten by most people and probably only remembered by political history anarchs like me. But when it, but it took place when it did. And that really sort of managed to explode into the sort of big political scandal of the era and one that's remembered to this day, sort of where pretty much in British politics, any sex scandal that takes place is sort of compared is sort of compared its importance to Perfumo. And so that's it's an interesting book as well for sort of discuss, discussing sort of the early sixties, late fifties, um uh, social political history of the era. Uh, the next book is sort of Similar to um, to uh, Dan Bordheim's book, uh, it's called A Very English Scandal, 2016, by John Preston. You probably know this because it was adapted to TV a few years ago um, with Hugh Grant and Ben Wishaw, because it covers the, uh, the the Thorpe affair, where Jeremy Thorpe, who was leader of the Liberal Party, had an affair with Norman Scott, who was a male model. Um, he tried to cover this up and then attempted to kill Scott. Um, it's a really good account of the history. Um, it's one. It's an account that frankly couldn't have been written when Thorpe was alive because Thorpe would have sued because Thorpe denied that he ever did it. And the trial that um, that, the, that <coughs> when he was tried for this in the late seventies, he was found not guilty in a very suspicious uh, manner. And, you know, he was the, 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 the judge was openly biased in favour of Thorpe, so much so that in that uh, in the week. That the thought was found not guilty of the uh, you had the secret policeman's ball being held in London, which is a sort of charity event for Amnesty International, and, um, and Peter Cook famously did a sketch directly inspired by it, where he gave this sort of deeply funny uh, sketch of, of a judge of, of, of a judge something up making fun of the uh, the sort of sh the, the utterly open bias of the of the um, judge as well as sort of the absurdity of the way it had been handled which that's unusual somewhere if you, if you put in Peter Cook judge's speech at a court that's very entertaining and very funny but um, th th you get a sense that, that again like the like an English affair by Davenport Hines it very much sets the scandal in the context of the time and in, in some ways it, it does the opposite of um, of just the opposite for the Thorpe affair <coughs> um, to uh, the Perfume affair, where it does show how actually this was an important scandal. It's not that it wasn't just, though it was absurd, and it has deeply this is absurdity of it, this is almost gilbert and sort of an operatic ridiculousness to it. This was an important scandal. This was really a proper scandal where a leading politician did in fact attempt to kill somebody. He hired a hitman, a, a deeply incompetent hitman, it must be said, uh, to kill um, Scott. And so that's worth reading. Again, Preston's a journalist, and you really do get that sort of journalistic uh, ability to convey stuff, uh, to convey, convey information uh, quite 
uh, the brevity books without uh, without uh, miscounting them. Uh, the next book is called Thatcher's Britain, two thousand nine, uh, by Richard uh, Richard Byron, and this is this gives you sort of the underpinnings of Thatcherism as an ideology, and and, and how Thatcher became leader of the Conservative Party, and why Thatcherism became the dominant uh, dominant uh, the dominant strand of British conservatism in the eighties and to a degree remains influential on British conservatism. And he discusses, for example, Enoch Powell as a sort of John the Baptist uh, figure. And to Thatcherism, he discusses the sort of failure of the post war conservatives in the seventies. He also makes a point which I like which I really did like because it it's a, it's something that people it's rarely pointed out. Is that Thatcher that Thatcher was going to win the next general election this was going to win the sort of general election that was going to take place in the early 80s, regardless to whether the Falklands War took place or not. Because it's a very common opinion about British politics in the early 80s is that the Falklands War was what gave Thatcher the election, the, the 83 election. Where Vinan points out very clearly that the Conservatives were on, were, were set to win that general election, whether it was in 1982 or 1983 or 1984, as it was meant to be, as it was meant to be called regardless to whether uh, you had the Falklands War. Um, and it's a very good overview of the idea of, sort of Thatcherism and sort of intellectual, uh, sort of intellectual, uh, sort of intellectual uh, history of Thatcherism and the sort of non-conservative sort of influences, sort of the political context, the cultural context of things changed in the 70s that sort of gave Birth of Thatcherism and to the gave Thatcher, the put Thatcher's lead to the Tory party in 75 and then eventually the Prime Minister from 79 to, 19, uh, to 1990. Uh, the next book is Speaking for England, 2010 by Martin Pugh, which is a, uh, a not, not very long but very comprehensive, but good comprehensive overview of the history of the Labour Party. Um, you get to see the Labour Party from its very early beginnings in the late 19th century with the Trade Unions, the Social Democratic Federation, the, the Independent Labour Party, and its formation of the uh, the Labour Agitation Committee in 1900, the information as the legal as the, as the Labour Party, the new black packs of the in its early years, the concept of the exception of the Constitution, the Labour Party in 1918, which really does form the Labour Party as a co as a proper co cohesive political party and as a socialist party, and then obviously you get the look of the Labour governments from the first government in 1924 up until would be New Labour. Well, I think it was published just after the Gordon Brown the Labour Party had, been, had lost the nineteen had lost the two thousand ten general election. Gordon Brown just lost office, so it's a, it's a good description of, of sort of Labour Party history from sort of uh, prehistory of the nineteenth century up until that point. Uh, the next one is the Conservatives: A History, two thousand and eleven, by Robin Harris, and this is very much sort of a, very much a companion book with uh, Pew's book. Uh, because it is essentially covers, it does the same thing for the Conservative Party. So it covers the Conservative Party from its sort of very sort of primordial origins in the Restoration, with the, where they with the Cavaliers right up until into the 18th century, with uh, Burke and Pitt, and then into the 19th century with the sort of pre-reformed Tories, and then the, the Conservatives under Peel, Derby, Disraeli, Salisbury, Balfour, Bonnelaw. Um, <coughs> The sort of great sort of um, the year of 1922, where the Conservative Party is saved from being sort of merged with Jerry Lloyd George's Liberals, and then the party under Baldwin, Churchill, Macmillan, even Macmillan, and so on, Thatcher, and, and uh, sorry, Heath, Thatcher, Major, and then the uh, sort of the sort of Tory wars of, the, of 1997 to 2005, and eventually in the, the early years, and then. Um, uh, the, the, the sort of Cameroons and David Cameron uh, from 2006 up until 2010, and the the, book, the edition I obviously published in 2011. It's um, you get you get a bit of discussion about the history, you know, the sort of the, the the return of the Conservatives to office under the uh, coalition with the Liberal Democrats. Now, Owen Harris actually worked for Molly Thatcher in the Conservative Research Department, and then in the um, then in Downing Street during her time in. Um, in as Prime Minister, and so he just mentioned the fact that um, it, he's the one who said about this the, the single volume history of uh, Margaret Thatcher. He does say in the beginning of the book that the book will cover more about 
sort of pre that sort of pre nineteen forty five conservative history than post war, and that is true. Uh, most of the uh, the significant portion of the book is taken up by the nineteenth century, particularly uh, Disraeli, um, particularly sort of late sort of eighteen fifties to the eighteen nineties. But nevertheless, it's a really good comprehensive view overview of the Conservative Party history up to that point, and it's really enjoyable. It's in some ways it's sort of an alternative history of Britain in that period where you get to see it from because in, in, in British history there is this thing called the Whig interpretation of history, which is very where the Whigs who were the sort of the opponents of the Tories in the Restoration and in the eighteenth century uh, developed this idea of uh, under particularly a, a story called Thomas Barrington Corney that British history had a particular was on a particular road and it was progressing and things were getting better and the Conservatives are sort of a counter history to that in a way. Not at a, not intentionally by Harris, but it sort of does it sort of it's interesting to really compare to compare the compare the ideas because it really does uh, give you a a good counterpoint to it. Uh, I say sorry about repeating myself. I should also say that um <coughs> that um oh I forgot what I was gonna say then. Uh, oh yes I'm one one issue I do have with the book is that Harris is very much a Thatcher writer, so he happens to portray the Tories post-war as as very. Um, he, has, he does have that Thatcher writer issue of, of describing the Tories as sort of the the, the, the Thatcher writer as a break with the Tories of the past, and he's more critical than I would be on Macmillan and Heath, even though I don't particularly like Heath. Um, I find. He he very much gives a Thatcherite view of Heath, which is unfair for all of my criticisms, and my personal criticisms of the man himself. Uh, but still, it's a very good one volume comprehensive history of the Conservatives. Another one would be, I can't remember the year, the year this was published, but there was a re uh, there was an updated version done in 1907 called The Conservative Party, I think it was, by. Oh, I've forgotten his name now. Uh, Robert Blake wrote History of the Conservative Party. It, that is another comprehensive but a lot smaller history. and But though that's a lot more dense. And he is very much a partisan for Disraeli. And so he he, he, he has the opposite. He has sort of the. He, he very much. He views the History of the Conservative Party through a sort of Disraeli lens of Disraeli being the one nation Tory sort of prophet and everything after that is seen in that view, which. Yes, it's personal views, but it's not as, say, comprehensive as Harrison's. Then I would uh, give uh, Blake's book a look over because it's interesting. Because he also wrote a biography of Andrew Bond Law, who was a sort of. Uh, uh, was until um, uh, until this trust became Prime Minister, the shortest uh, reigning Prime Minister in the in the sort of modern British politics, sort of modern democratic politics in the 19th, after the sort of expansion of the franchise. But he was in office for about, I think, he came in office in October 22, March, April, May. Yeah, so, yeah, eight months. Um, and that's a good he called The Unknown Prime Minister, which is uh, worth a read, because it's one of the rare biographies of Bond Law that you have. There's not many of them about, even though he's a fascinating figure of the sort of Edwardian, of the British Edwardian politics and the uh, sort of First World War. Uh, the next book, though, is Power of the Hundred, which is sort of a collection of essays, uh, which was published in 2012, uh, edited by the Conservative peer Lord Howard of Rising, where it discusses the political thought of Robert Powell, and it had, um, it's the, the contributors are of the Howard himself, um, Andrew Roberts is in there, uh, Roger Scruton, um, Tom Bauer. And they all discuss different aspects of his political career, say his attitude towards um, immigration. Tom Bowen does one, does an essay analysing um, the, the the immigration speech, incorrectly down the rivers of blood, where he criticises Powell, where he, where he takes a critical view of it, but at the same time puts it in context and also points out that Powell wasn't necessarily wholly inaccurate in his dis in his predictions, but they weren't wholly they weren't wholly accurate either. Uh, Andrew Roberts talks about um, Powell. I think it's Powell's uh, sort of uh, talks about Powell's sort of history. Um, 
Rubbish, Rogers, who, Rogers who talks about Powell's use of language and he sort of how he, particularly his ability to think of speech is really interesting. And there's also one I've forgotten her name now. She is she's one of Ann, uh, Alan Alan Sugar's um, uh, uh, sort of right hand people on the Apprentice. Her name is Margaret. I don't know what what her uh, uh, surname is. I've forgotten her name. But uh, she wrote a, a very interesting essay on uh, on Powell's. Powell is a classicist, and she points out the thing about the fact that the, the, the lexicon is still used. It's either Herodotus or, Thuth or Thucydides. It's still used by classical classic students studying classics today. And so that's an interesting look at Powell, the sort of intellectual tradition that Powell established and its influence on British politics, on um, British conservatism uh, since his, uh, that he had on British politics since, well, since, well at the time and subsequently. Uh, the next book is The Liberal Unionist Party from 2017 by Ian Cartwood. This is about the uh, the party that was established by the anti-Home Rule Liberals who split from the Liberal Party in 1886. Um, most notable of these being uh, Joseph Chamberlain, who I've previously mentioned before. This gives you an overview of the party from its sort of um, its origins in the Home Rule, the Liberal split over Home Rule, and its development as a as a partner with the Conservatives in the Unionist coalitions under Salisbury, and eventually its um, Merging into the Conservative Party in 1912, uh, which is why the Conservative Party is modern name is the Conservative and Unionist Party, um, and also the fact that the, the, the Scottish wing of this remains sort of independent from the Conservatives in England as the Scottish Unionist Party until 1964, and the, the Ulster Unionists, who are a party in Northern Ireland, were a part of this, part, particularly part of the, uh, the part of this um, had elements of the Liberal Unionists as well. And it's a good uh, overview history. It's, it's an academic history, so you really have to sort of be interested in this period. And I am. In, this is one of the interested one of the areas of British political history I'm interested in. This sort of home rule, Irish home rule debates, and um, particularly the uh, the unionist side of things. But if you are interested in that, give it a good read. Uh, it's worth a read. Um, and the next book is sort of a classic of British political history, which is. The Strange Death of Liberal England from 1935 by George Dangerfield, and it discusses the Liberal governments of Asquith and David Lloyd George from 1906 to 1914. Um, I think it been sometimes sort of read, but I think it does have hell in it. It does go into sort of wartime moments of Lloyd George coalition and post war Europe that came to an end in 1902. It sort of discusses why, how the Liberals went in pretty much a pretty much 20 years from a huge thumping great majority at the 1906 general election to being third party in British government in 19, in the early 1920s. And it's because it's all the things that sort of went wrong for the Liberals and how it's sort of, and, and the, the rise of the Labour Party, the actions of the Conservative Party, sort of the, the industrial, dis, the, the industrial and rest of the period, the First World War, and also the Irish Home Rule crisis. Though, with Daniel Field, he's a liberal of that era, and he does have a habit of portraying the liberal government um, during the Home Rule crisis as being in the always being in the right. Though he, I think he does, from what I remember, he does criticism of most of the Quran incident, which was for those who don't know the, uh, the when the Home Rule crisis was flames up in 1912. Uh, the 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 unionists in what is now Northern Ireland strongly opposed it. They signed a covenant led by a uh, uh, Sir Edward Carson, who was a famous barrister and Irish Unionist leader of the era, and uh, Sir James Craig, who went on to become the first Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, and they 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 say they're going to oppose um, Irish Home Rule, and they start gunnering. They establish the Ulster Volunteers, which become the Ulster Volunteer uh, um, Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF, uh, which is a different organisation, the terrorist organisation, which was established in the sixties and that carried out terrorist attacks throughout the Troubles. And um, they were very, they were prepared to fight the government, and then, and so this led to a crisis, a growing crisis, which in 1914 came to a head when the Home Rule Act was passed, and the government said they were going to use the armed forces. Winston Churchill, who was um, first Lord of the Admiralty, sent um, battleships to uh, to be anchored off the coast of Belfast and Londonderry, um, and <coughs> the army were going to be used. However, the a lot of the one thing that people don't seem to know about the British Army is that how heavily Irish it was. Both uh, probably more well known that in terms of the ranks, but the officers 
a lot of the officers had either were Anglo or were part of the Anglo Irish Protestant Ascendancy, who ran who were the, the ruling Clatton Army, or they were um, married into or related in some way to uh, to the Ascendancy. And so they were deeply concerned about the idea of having to fight against the Unionists. And uh, so, uh, the, uh, so and what happened was we cut out a, a, an order that was given. Uh, there's an order that was, uh, that was wrongly worded. The, in fact, there's a uh, Haldane, who was the uh, Secretary of State for War at the time, actually said this um, to the, to the, uh, to the um, British forces in Ireland, uh, which were based at Corral, which is just outside Dublin, I believe. And in reaction to this, the army officers at Corral camp uh, offered their resignations instead of so they wouldn't have to follow the orders. They they were so horrified at the idea that they're going to be used to use force against their fellow unions, people who they regarded as British, who they regarded as being patriotic and not doing anything wrong. And defend, they were as far as they were concerned, defending the British Union and the British Empire. And now this is referred to as a mutiny, though it's not technically a mutiny because the officers didn't refuse the orders. They just offered their resignations in in submitting the orders. And now, now Dangerfield sort of Dangerfield does actually, he's from what I can remember, reasonably fair about that. But he does have a habit when he's discussing the Home Rule crisis more broadly, of being very partisan liberal and portraying the Unionists and the Conservatives as reckless, dangerous, and and not. He doesn't point out the fact that. The reason why the Liberals were passing the Home Rule Bill was because they'd lost the majority in, in the two general elections of 1910 and they were lying, relying on the Home Rule supporting party of the Irish Parliamentary Party and in a supply and in a, a supply confidence agreement, of which this agreement, agreement uh, the, the Central Bank of this agreement was, the Liberals agreeing to pass a Home Rule Bill. And so there was an element of, of jiggly pokery going on among the Liberals at the time, and down to feel sort of rushes over that fact which uh, which even to this day people on liberal uh, even within the liberal democrats have had to do this i remember there was a discussion of downfield's book back in about 2012 and it was uh, on a radio 4 program and shirley williams who's been late who, who, who was a liberal democrat at the time she's now sadly no longer with us but she was discussing this and she was sort of she gave she gave what can be described as a sort of unreconstructed liberal liberal view of the Ulster Home Rule crisis of the year where she sort of described the the genius of being uh, of being sort of headbangers she didn't exactly she didn't use that word but it was very much of that sort of idea and the conservatives were being reckless and that the liberals were sort of the liberal government of Asquith were sort of were, were sensible and not demanding too much which isn't true but that is one caveat for James Phil's book However, it is it is rightly regarded as a classic because it's very well written. Dangerfield was a British journalist, was a journalist for the British uh, version of um, Vanity Fair, and it's really well written and really entertaining. But he does have some, he, he very funny written some of the line, some of the uh, bits of the book, and so it's worth it. And so it's rightly regarded as a classic, and it's very much worth it. Though we should have that caveat about um, home, about the way he portrays home rule. And um, the next book is actually linked to this, uh, linked to the the. I think it is the last two books because it's called Northern Nationalism 1994 by Amy Phoenix and it discusses um, nationalists in Northern Ireland um, from, from I think from the 18 from the 1880s I think uh, I should say I read this at university I really enjoyed it it's, it's an academic history but it's worth a read if you get a chance and it discusses Northern nationalists in Northern Ireland um, from the 1880s up until about 19 until the 1930s I think. And it's really interesting. So you get to look at sort of the other side of British politics in Ireland of the Irish Parliamentary Party. This is the party that uh, John, uh, sorry, that, um, that uh, Parnell was leader of. And you've got John Redmond and John Dillon, and uh, it's really good. Uh, it's a really interesting part of sort of the British politics. That you don't, it's, and it's an important thing to understand. And the reason why I mentioned it, it's an important thing to understand British politics because the Irish Parliamentary Party. From the 1880s up until Irish partition in 1922 was a dominant force in British politics. It uh, pretty much from not through through Gladstone's um, final uh, uh, Gladstone's final premierships in the late 1880s and early 1890s through to that obviously that Liberal government before the First World War, the Irish Parliamentary Party is 
either keeping the Liberals in power or is close to it, and so it's, so it has a big effect on uh, Irish, uh, on sort of British politics as a whole. And so it's interesting to see this discussion of the Irish Parliamentary Party in what is now Northern Ireland and what becomes Northern Ireland, I should say, over the course of the book, and how how partition and how nationalist uh, and, and how nationalism in Northern Ireland develops somewhat differently from that in the, what becomes the free in, in the south of Ireland and particularly what becomes the free state what's now the Republic of Ireland and how that for example North, what's now Northern Ireland was in many cases the uh, the, the, the home the sort of the sort of, um, the sort of the heartland of actually heart, the, the Irish Parliamentary Party unusually, you know, which when you think about Northern Ireland you very much think in return to politics, the Ulster Unionist Party, but the Irish Parliamentary Party very much, uh, the Northern Ireland seats, seats of what's now Northern Ireland, particularly Belfast, were strongly, um, you know, strong, sort of, the sort of heart, some of the, some of the seats were very much the heartland of the of Irish Home Rule. Uh, it's worth, a, that's again, it's worth a read, it's sort of, sort of like the joint edge of British politics. From sort of the other side, of, the other side of the coin, from the side of liberals and conservatives. Now the next two books are both by um, the late March Cowling, who was a, an academic at King's College, and <coughs> they both kind of cover uh, two important subjects of British politics in the interwar period. The first is the impact of Labour, nineteen twenty to nineteen twenty four, from nineteen seventy one, and this covers the right, the immediate rise of the Labour Party in, in the early twenties, from being uh, uh, the third party in British politics to getting into government for the first time in 1924. And it starts with a bar, I can't remember the by election, uh, maybe somewhere in, no, no, it's not South Wales, that's Newport, that was 1922. Some, uh, what, the, where there was the by election you discusses, and you also get a discussion of the the final years of the um, of the Lloyd George post war coalition and sort of split of the Liberals, the sort of discussion of the split. Between the liberals of the Lloyd George Liberals, which are in the post court, in the coalition, and the Asquith, the Liberals, the, the other faction of the Liberal Party under Asquith, which is in opposition. And it's really interesting. You also get a discussion of the Conservative Party and that discussion of the events of, nine, of, of October 1922 when the Conservatives uh, leave um, the coalition. But where there's a backbench revolt, uh, well, it's a revolt with backbenchers and um, junior ministers against the leadership of the Conservative Party by uh, Sir Austin Chowdhury, Joseph Chamberlain's son. And Lord Chamberlain's brother, where they're led by um, uh, Bonnelaw, who had, who had resigned as leader, um, I think a year or two before, uh, yeah, the year before, and uh, Sandy Baldwin, who was obviously would become leader and prime minister, and they they revolt against the idea of it going into another coalition, go, uh, fighting an, the next general election as a coalition, though they were willing to form a coalition with Lloyd George if after the general election. They were just opposed to the idea of fighting another general election as they had done in 1918 as a coalition. And so you get that discussed there and then you obviously get Baldwin's first government and obviously the the the, <coughs> the um the first Labour government. I think I, I can't remember it's been again it's been I was at university when I read this. Uh because it's actually very it's quite difficult to get hold of, and I was able to read it because it was at my library in, in the university library. Um, but I think it does discuss the the Znobiel affair, which brought down the Labour government, which was um, a sort of forged document claiming to be from the Comintern, which was the, the foreign uh, branch of the Soviet Union, so the foreign policy branch of the Soviet Union, uh, written by uh, Evgeny written by Znobiel, who was one of the old Bolsheviks, uh, claiming that, that arguing that the um, the more communist propaganda and sort of communist subversion to take place within the armed forces and among British workers to provoke a revolution. It, it was a forgery. As far as I think it was a forgery by the by a white Russian forger in Berlin. But it got. But it was good. But it was enough to sort of, sort of um, good enough to sort of swing, cause a collapse in the Liberal vote towards the Conservatives and win the, win the Conservatives the um, nineteen. The October twenty four general election, it, um, it was playing on the fears of fears that the Labour government wasn't quite trustworthy when it came to the Soviet Union because they had had a, there was a there was a there was a uh, the Campbell affair which had taken place in uh, the summer of nineteen twenty four, where a communist um, newspaper editor called Gregory Campbell, who had in fact been a Liberal, I think at one point, 
had advocated effectively strikes and mutinies in the army, and then they'd been attempted prosecuting uh, by Sir Patrick Hastings, who was late. Sir Patrick Hastings, who was Labour's uh, Attorney General, uh, but then there was various things that went on among the backbenchers with the great firesiders led by um, James Maxton uh, to try and stop this prosecution. And eventually, Campbell did get prosecuted, and that sort of that was one of the things that led to the, the led to the the co lost confidence in the, the first Labour government that brought about the interim election, and that was sort of the thing that led into the tsunami affair, which I think he's also which I think he's discussed in. <coughs> in impact of Labour, though again I haven't read it for about let's say eight years, so I may be wrong on that, but that that but it certainly covers that period in history. And then the next calendar book was written in nineteen thirty five is the impact of Hitler, nineteen thirty three to nineteen forty, and it discusses uh, appeasement and the rise of the Nazis and British politics domestically, and it also it discusses how much British pol domestic political considerations were being taken into account in, in foreign policy as much as the sort of international aspect of things. And how, uh, for example, Chamberlain, when he goes to Munich, is as much thinking about the possibility of how this will affect him in winning the next general election, which was set to be in 1940, as he was for, for, um, for actually the sort of international side of things. And it also gives a sort of it, it gives a it, it, it does it does a good job of explaining Chamberlain's why Chamberlain was going for appeasement why Chamberlain was supporting appeasement why Baldwin supported appeasement and it was very, and very much the sense of never again that they had seen the First World War and they never wanted to repeat it and it's very it does get over the uh, very good very very real sense that Chamberlain's support for appeasement was fundamentally stem from his heart of never wanting another war, of wanting to really try and keep the peace. As unsuccessful and as frankly wrong as that policy was at the time, it was the policy he truly believed, and also one that the country would accept, the country wouldn't have accepted uh, uh, rearmament uh, as very distinct as a by-election in 1944, where the, where the suggestion of rearmament was made, and in this by-election an anti-rearmament candidate won with a landslide. And so the so to sort of, and that is mentioned in the, in the book as well. It shows how appeasement was, whilst it might have been the wrong policy, though actually Cowling was Cowling, from what I can, from what I know of the man, was actually in, actually was quite sympathetic to the idea of appeasement. But he makes a point that regardless of whether you think whether you think appeasement was a good or bad policy, it was the only acceptable policy of the, to the British public at the time. They weren't prepared for war. Unlike say in early 1939, when definitely they were. Uh, now I should say about about Cowling's book, he was very much that he was very it's a very much academic histories and they're very they're sort of uh, very um, uh, densely written. But if you're interested in the period, they're worth the read because you get a wealth of knowledge which you don't really get, um, which I've not seen in any of the histories of the period. I have uh, though I will say there's one book which I I haven't actually written down but which I now remembered it because of the impact of Hitler. Written by John Charmley, it's called Chamberlain and the Lost Peace, which is about appeasement. It covers pretty much a similar uh, period of time as as Cowling's Impact of Hitler, and it sort of again it very discusses um, uh, uh, it discusses appeasement in Chamberlain, and it, 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 again it makes the point that Chamberlain Chamberlain's action support for appeasement was genuinely was a genuine attempt to keep the peace in Europe, and Cowley, uh, like Cowling, Charmley. More so than uh, Carol and Charmley very much believed that Peter was the correct policy. But he also makes the point that it was the only po acceptable policy to the British public at the time. Um, now the next two books are by Andrew Rawlsley, and they are a history of new of the the Labour governments of Tony Blair, of the new Labour governments of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. One of which is called Servant, Servants of the People, 2000. Though there's an edition uh, later, another edition that was done in 2001 that sort of takes in the 2001 general election and uh, the sort of immediate impact of that. And also End of the Party, 2010, which covers pretty much from 2001 to 2010. And they give you a good overview of the Labour of those Labour governments, of what they tried to do, of the pers of the clashing personalities, particularly between Blair and Brown. And also you get the End of the end of the party gives you a really good account of sort of how Gordon Brown's premiership went from crisis to crisis, 
pretty much from when he gave when in the two thousand and autumn two thousand and seven um, autumn conference where he suggested there was going to be a general election soon. The Conservatives held their conference um, and uh, got, uh, um, George Osborne, who was the chancellor, who was the shadow chancellor, put out a um, made a speech where he said he was going to cut inheritance tax, and that scared Brown, and then Brown didn't have the uh, didn't didn't uh, carry out and that didn't decided to have, not have a general election out of fear that that, that that the Conservatives might win, and that sort of set the sort of tone for the press's dislike of Brown and sort of started first which was starting for the crisis that was sort of hit uh, the the that his government from then on and obviously get a good obviously it was really good account of sort of the latent government's sort of reaction to the um, the, the MPs expenses as well as the, the 2010 general election and so it, again it's worth the read because it gives you a good overview of account those two books together give a good overview of the new Labour governments. Now the last two um, thing recommendations I'm going to make are not books they are uh, articles, but they're both. You can find them both online. Uh, the first is is the post-war consensus a myth, which was published in Controversy in 2008, and it's an, an article jointly written by Ben Pinlot, Dennis Kavanagh, and Peter Morrison. And effectively, the, arg the, the argument they make is is that the post-war consensus uh, Pinlot argues against, and I think the, that Morris either Kavanagh or Morris argues for the post-war consensus, and then. Morrison, not one, the, either, which one it is, uh, sorry, Pinlock makes the argument against the idea that there was, uh, makes the argument for the idea that there was a uh, consensus, and I seem to remember that either Kavanagh or Morris, one makes the argument for the idea that there was a post-war consensus, and the other one makes a sort of, uh, it's, it's sort of uh, makes an argument for in between. I've not, I may, not, I, it, again, this is something I've not read in a long time, but I really should. I'm sorry about this. I really should have read the article again before doing this. But I, I know that Ben Pinlock very much argues against the post-war consensus. He argues that the, the, the era of the era of post-war consensus is in fact an argument of partisan division. That the differences between um, the Conservative and Labour were quite broad in that period, and that the similarities were very. That there were that the more the maybe that the basic similarities were are a lot more sort of. Uh, not so much exaggerated, but emphasised in histories of that period than they were in reality. It's uh, an interesting idea, one that I have a lot of sympathy for. Um, it, in fact, there's a very good video on, on the YouTube channel of the uh, IEA by Steve, Dr. Steve Jones. If you put in post-war consensus, uh, Steve Jones, or you just put in post-war consensus, it'll, it'll come up. It's, on the, uh, it's a video on the... Um, the IEA, the uh, Institute of Economic Affairs, where they discuss, where he makes an argument very strongly against the post-war consensus and, and a very convincing one. So that I'll, I'll, if, I, if I remember, I'll put a link to that in the um, in the description. And then the final article, which again, this as I say, is something you can find online for free, is The Great Moving Right Show from Little Marxism in 1979 by Stuart Hall, who was a sociologist, and he discusses the idea uh, it, it very much uh, it was written, as I say written in 1979, written before the Thatcher the election of the Thatcher government. But it, it points out that the election of Margaret Thatcher is not it, that, that it's it's very much it's not a going against the grain of British politics or British cultural or social life. It's very much a part of that. Where Hall, who is a Marxist, and I, I should say I am not a Marxist, but Hall makes a good point here. In this article, that British society has been in the seventies, moots in the uh, in the seventies from the early seventies to the mid seventies to obviously throughout the nineteen seventies, sorry, has been moving to the political right more broadly, and the Thatcher government is just a, just an expression of this, which is a which is a, a, a good point. It, it, it's very much a, a sort of a sort of a sort of counter argument to the usual one you get from both Thatcherite and anti Thatcherite. So Thatcher was a was sort of immediate break with the post-war consensus. Now, I don't think she was, and I think Hall, in this case, is right that she was that Thatcherism was merely sort of the, the evolution of British politics moving rightward over the course of the seventies and even the even the mid even the late sixties. And um, in in um, in Seasons of the Sun by um, Dominic Sandbrook, 
there's a point made about the the last Labour government under Callaghan in the late 70s, uh, where um, due to the IMF crisis, where Britain sort of Britain effectively went bankrupt in 76, um, and they had to go to Callaghan to the IMF to get a loan. Uh, they had the IMF made them made the government put in various austerity measures and various sort of econo- efforts to make economic changes. More, actually, more than they needed to. The, the figures actually got wrong. The crisis wasn't actually as bad as it was, but the, the Labour government did what the IMF wanted. And the Thames and the Exchequer at the time, Dennis Healy later said that he was the first monetarist Prime Minister and that he'd done a monetarist, monetarist Chancellor of the Exchequer and he'd done it better than the Conservative uh, Chancellors. He'd been a better monetarist than the Conservative Chancellors, chancellors who followed him. And again, the, the, and this is very much something that. Paul points us out that in terms of economics, the, the, the British party was moving rightwards in terms of culture, society, and more broadly politics itself was moving rightwards, particularly under Callaghan. And that's, that's also a point that Richard Vinan makes in, his, in that uh, Thatcher's Britain book about that sort of move right, that sort of general sort of move to the right across the board in British, in British life. So, and Hall, and Hall is a great example of that being said at the time. So it's well worth a read. Um, so that's um, that, well. That's the list. Um, I hope you, um, if, if you, anybody was interested in British politics, I think that could, particularly post-war British politics, that list should give you a good at least basis in that. Um, if there's a, of, of all those books to read, if you want particularly British post-war politics uh, discussion, the best ones to read would be *Road to 1945*, the Dominic Sandbrook books. Um, and those two articles is the post-war consensus myth and the Great Reason Right Show, the Conservatives speak for speak speaking for Britain and the Andrew Rawson books. Those, if you read those, you, that gives you a good comprehensive look of British political life from 1945, well, pretty much 19, 1931 up until uh, 2011. So um, uh, that's the list uh, done. Um, I think. Uh, actually inspired by Jim's suggestion, I'm going to do the next video on British political fiction recommendations, both um, both books, films and TV. So that'll probably be the next video you get. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you inform this this helps you if you're interested in British um, political history. That this this list helps you um, with uh, what where what to read and what you where to sort of start, especially, as I said, in terms of um, post-war British politics. And so I will see you next time, Richard. Bye.